for today is Philippians chapter 5, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. Chapter 2, 5 through 8. I'm going to read it. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who existed in the form of God, counted not to being own an equality with God, a thing to be grasped. Verse 7, but emptied himself, taking the form of servants, being made in the likeness of man. Verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient even into death. Ye are the days of the cross. May God blessing the reading. Amen. 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 Yeah, you know, I didn't realize until too late after I had sat down, I had an opportunity to introduce Michael Jackson to the congregation and I blew it. So I just know him as Mike though now. I haven't gotten to know you over the last couple months, Mike. So thank you for sharing with us and um, uh, thanks for filling in for Wanderson today. The scripture reading for today has specific importance when you consider communion because look at what it says uh, towards the end of the verse there. G well, uh, just the whole verse. I'll just paraphrase it. Jesus was God. He was equal to God in every respect. In fact, scripture tells us, it makes it very clear in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 and then verse 14, Jesus was the, the, was the God, it was God the Son, of course they were all there, God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son was the one who actually spoke the world into existence. The Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made by Him, through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made, and the Word became flesh. That's the key, that's what comes out in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, the Word became flesh flesh and dwelt among us, the Word who was God, the Word who was with God, the Word who made everything. And it tells us here that not only did He come, was He found in the appearance as a man, He humbled Himself even to the death of the cross. And communion is an opportunity for us to be reminded of this fact, because this is the key essence as to how it is that our carnal, hard-hearted, selfish, sinful hearts are miraculously changed by God. It comes as we realize in our minds when we remember what all Jesus did for us. We cannot change our lives. We cannot make ourselves better. No matter how hard we try, we, are, we can look good on the outside, but we are not going to get to heaven apart from understanding and accepting by faith realizing, thinking about it, God became a man, died for us on the cross for one purpose, so that we would want to be in right relationship with Him. Not so that we could just go through the motions of trying to be good for Him, so that we would want from the inside out, we want to do whatever He says when we understand what He went through for us. In fact, I found this, and uh, I'm going to read a quick little quote from you. I didn't make a slide for it, but it's from Acts of the Apostles, page 333. Talking about Philippians 2, verse 8, it says this. Verse 8 is where it says, He humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Paul, the one who was writing this, Paul, the Apostle Paul, was convinced that if they could be brought to comprehend, if the Philippians could be brought to comprehend the amazing sacrifice made by the majesty of heaven, it applies to us today in the very same way, if we could be brought to comprehend, to understand, to remember the amazing sacrifice made by Jesus, who's the majesty of heaven, this is the effect, this is the influence it would have on our lives. All selfishness would be banished from their lives. End of quote. In other words, we're converted. 
everything selfish and proud and mean-spirited and unforgiving and hateful and everything that's in our hearts because of our carnal human natures are changed miraculously if we could be brought to comprehend, to understand, to remember the amazing sacrifice made by Jesus, all those things would be changed, our hearts, that hard heart would be taken away and we would have hearts of flesh. That's the miracle of grace that we cannot accomplish apart from remembering what Jesus did. A few months ago, I think it was March, Angie and I was on a long trip driving up to northern Michigan uh, where her family lives, which is where she is today, her and Jenica. And as our, we were driving up there, she, she always has these different things we can listen to on the car on her phone, different uh, uh, programs, stories, whatever, sermons. And she had one that she said, that, have you ever heard of this program? I said, no, I've never heard of it before. She said, well, let's listen to it. Let's see what it's about. And it was a program called Fit to Fat to Fit. Have any of you ever heard of it? Fit to Fat to Fit. I come to find out later afterwards um, that it actually was a, uh, a TV series on the A&E network called Fit to Fat to Fit. But at the time when we were listening to it, I just thought it was a, a radio program that we were listening to over from her, that she had downloaded on her cell, on her uh, phone. And the, had a very novel concept to this program, Fit to Fat to Fit, that I had never heard of before. And when I heard it, I was just amazed. The concept was that there was a, um, a personal trainer. His name was JJ. Always been fit all of his life. Now he's in the business of actually training other people to get them fit. JJ, the personal trainer, was going to have a client whose name was Ray, and he was going to work with Ray over a period of time to help get Ray fit. Ray was very out of shape. Well, that's not so novel because I've heard of that type of idea before. The novelty to this program was this. Before JJ could begin to work with his client, Ray, JJ had to take three months where he was going to eat everything he could possibly eat that was unhealthy. He, he was not allowed to exercise. He was supposed to gain anywhere from 60 to 70 pounds in three months' time before he started meeting with his client, Ray, and then they were both going to go through the exercise and losing weight process together so that he could have a better understanding of what it was like for Ray to help Ray become fit. I thought, wow, I never thought of that before. But when I heard that, you can't help but think of Philippians 2, verse 5 through 8, can you? God came and humbled himself to become a man, even to the point of the cross. Why? So that you and I could become spiritually fit, so that we could be converted, so that we could be changed, so that God can save us eternally, fit to fat to fit. Here's a picture of J.J. and Ray before they uh, started working together. And it was, just, it was just interesting to listen to this program begin to unfold. Ray, they were interviewing him, and this is his attitude at the beginning. Before he knew anything about this novelty to what was about to happen, Ray said, I've tried to lose weight and I just cannot do it. I, try, I need an outside source of strength because I can't do it on my own. Does that sound familiar to any of you who have tried to be good in the Christian life, but you just can't do it? I need an outside source of strength because I can't do it on my own. I doubt that any trainer can really understand all that I will be going through when we start my workout process. So that was his attitude before he learned what was about to happen. I don't think that the trainer is going to understand what I'm going through. Do you think Jesus understands what you go through and I go through on a daily basis? Absolutely. J.J. then comes into the picture and he sits down and then this is what J.J. tells Ray. I got something that I, I have to tell you. I'm going to be gaining at least 60 pounds from where I am right now so that I can better relate to and understand what you're going through and where you're coming from. So that means that you and I are going to do this task of getting you back to being healthy again together. Now, the crux of understanding this, 
Like it says in, in I, was, I was talking about Philippians 2, 5 through 8, when we understand what Jesus did to us, it does something to our hearts. It changes us from the inside out. That's exactly the effect that this has on Ray, the client. Look, look at, well, this is what he says. He says, I don't recommend that, but on the other hand, it breaks my heart. Do you see the purpose of communion when we remember? Jesus says, when you take the emblems of his body and of his blood, he says, do this in remembrance of me. When we do that, it's designed. The purpose is to break our hard hearts. That happened to Ray in this story. On the other hand, it breaks my heart that you're willing to do that to yourself for me. And he actually gets choked up when he was saying this. That you're willing to do that for me? Because I know how bad it feels to be like this. Jesus knows how bad it feels to be like us too. I know how bad it feels to be like this. And I don't want you to have to go there for someone like me. But if you're willing to do that for me, then I... Now notice the attitude that's changed here. If you're willing to do that for me, then I will be willing to listen to you. And I'll do what you tell me to do. Tell me that's not the purpose of the gospel. Tell me that's not why it's so important to remember what Jesus did. When we understand that, we say the very same thing to Jesus. You know what, Jesus, you did that for me. I am willing. You tell me what what to do and I'll, I'll listen to you. I will do what you say. Because I know you have my best interest at heart. I know you love me with an everlasting love. I know you're not going to tell me to do something that's not in my best interest. You becoming like a human being and dying in my place, living in my place, dying in my place. You must really love me. I want to trust you. If you have faith in me like that, then I want to have faith in you, Jesus. And in the story as it goes on, you see, well, I wasn't seeing, I was hearing. Uh, There was a time I put put the picture there where uh, JJ on the top left corner, he's bent over, got his hands on his knees. His little girl comes up to him. This is after he had binged. And uh, and he's trying to keep it down. She says, Daddy, what are you doing? He says, I'm trying not to throw up. That's how bad he felt in order to gain 60 pounds in three months' time. There on the lower left-hand corner, he's laying on the couch one day. And as he's laying on the couch, his wife comes up to him and she says, what are you doing? She had never seen him like this before. It was a new process for them, too. What are you doing? He says, I am trying not to die. Wow, I'm trying not to die. Can you think sometimes in the life of Jesus Christ where he was trying not to die prematurely? What about the time at the beginning of his ministry? Fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. He was so weak. He was so emaciated. He was so hungry. When Lucifer comes in the form of an angel from heaven and he tries to get him to use his powers that he could have done, which would have been an act of faithlessness by turning some stones into bread. And Jesus says, no, I'm going to trust God no matter what. He was trying not to die. What about the time when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane when uh, there he is sweating drops of blood going through this whole process for me, for you. He's trying not to die before he goes to the cross. He says to J.J., what are you doing? He says, I'm trying not to die. And there's a picture of him trying to, to choke down all the unhealthy food that he just binged on. And then there's a picture of him and, and Ray There's uh, J.J. doing burpees where you get down on all fours and you have to run like that. This was when he was very out of shape and it was so difficult for him to get back into shape as he worked out with Ray. There they are working out together. But not only did they work out together and go through that process, they celebrated together as well. Because when you get to the end of the story, the program that I was listening to in the car, they had the celebration day. There's Ray, there's his supporters, there's his family, there's his friends, they're all together. J.J. is there as well. Now I want you to notice, this is what Ray says at the end of the program. Ray says this, you put on 61 pounds of faith that I would do my part. And man, I couldn't have gotten here without you being there for me first. I owe you all that I am today. I love you. Thank you very much. When we begin to understand even a little bit of what Jesus went through for me, for you, to help us, to save us, so that we don't have to eternally die, we begin to understand that. We would respond like Ray did to JJ. I, I, 
I am so thankful for what you've done for me. I love you. Thank you very much. And we, like it says in 1 John 4, 9, we don't love Jesus first. We love him because he first loved us. When we understand the meaning of communion, it makes us want to love Jesus back. So let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. If today, if you would like to sign up again, or maybe sign up for the first time. Yes, I would like Jesus to be my personal trainer. I would like to accept him and accept the offer that he has made for me. I understand what he's already gone through for me, and because of that, I choose to accept by faith what he offers me today, then by all means participate in the communion service with us this morning. One thing before we do, before we take the communion, uh, just to explain in case there's anyone here who who doesn't, not aware of this. We also do something else at the Seventh-day Adventist Church that many churches don't do. We do what Jesus said that we should do. He did this before the very first communion service in John chapter 13. Before they did the communion, the emblems of his, the bread and the body, Jesus went around and he washed the disciples' feet. You're aware of that, I hope, right? In John chapter 13. And when he was washing the disciples' feet, he actually says this in John 13, if I, your Lord and Master, have done this to you, you also ought to do this to one another. And if you know these things, it says in John 17, 7, 13, verse 17, if you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do it. Now, in just a bit, we're going to break up and we're going to, um, to move back into the fellowship room. Those of you that would like to participate in the foot washing service, you're welcome to do so. You don't have to. I want to, want to make that clear. If you would feel more comfortable uh, remaining seated in an attitude of prayer here in the sanctuary until we come back for the communion, you're welcome to do that. So nobody's going to twist your arm. If you would like to just come and observe, you know, maybe you've never seen what a foot washing service was like before we come back for communion, by all means, you're welcome to come and observe. And again, if you would like to participate in the foot washing, we'll just pair up. There's a, a room in, in the back there for the men. Two by two, there's the towels and the water and the, the, the basins are all prepared. We'll pair up in just a bit. There's a room for married couples back there. There are signs. You'll notice there's signage. It'll be easy to find when you get there. And there's a room for the women to pair up and perform the foot washing. Remember, to, best you can, keep it in an attitude of prayer, even when you're participating in the foot washing before you come back for the communion service. Um, and when you do come back in for the communion service, I want you all to be aware of this. The, the deacons will rope off the side. It's going to make it easier for the deacons to serve the communion so that we're all seated in the middle section here when you come back. So just know that those off to the side will be seated in the middle. And they'll also have a little orange dot on the end of the aisles indicating those would be the pews to be seated in. It'll help us so that when they have the, the trays, they can serve you better when it's time for the communion. So I know that's a lot to remember. The most important thing though to remember, if you forget anything and forget everything else, remember, do this in remembrance of what Jesus has already done for you. That's the most important thing to remember. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for all that you have done for us. Thank you, Jesus. Change our hard hearts today. Break our hearts. Give us a new appreciation, help us to accept in a brand new way, a new beginning with you, Lord, so that when we leave, we know that the verse of Scripture applies. If anyone be in Christ, you're a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. May each of us experience that again this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for that being your will, and we ask that that would become reality for us today. Participate with us in the foot washing. Bring us back in for the communion in a bit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's break up at this time.